Good afternoon. So I am Chris Lee, um, as you may have heard, and I get to uh, host this really amazing book launch today. Um, it's really moving to seeing uh, images of Jim. Um, I met Jim almost 20 years ago, actually 1996, 1997. Um, I'd heard about this mythical Jim Wong Chu character around Chinatown, um, and then sort of very soon after I met him, I got dragged into all these ACWW activities, and uh, I have to say, I wouldn't be doing what I do now without that, so um, express my gratitude to Jim as well as to Marlene for sharing him with us for so many years. Um, I am, uh, among the things I do, I teach in the English department at UBC. I teach Asian Canadian literature primarily, which is a direct result of the work that Jim has been doing all these years. Uh, and also, I'm currently the director of the Asian Canadian Asian Migration Studies Program. So we are a new program. Uh, we started in 2014 as part of UBC's tribute to the 76 Japanese Canadian students who were removed from the university at the start of the Second World War. So we are very aware of the histories of injustice that have uh, affected Asian Canadian communities, and we are also dedicated to making sure that these histories and cultures are preserved, celebrated, and not forgotten. Um, Jim was a really strong supporter of the ACAM program from the very start. I remember having coffee with him, having him strategize. Um, around that time, and this is really amazing, Jim donated his papers to the UBC library. I think because Marlene was going to throw them out or threaten to. <laughs> And uh, there's a story I'll tell you about that later on, too. But um, the, this is probably the most complete collection of Asian Canadian cultural activist material, I think, anywhere in the country. Maybe except for Terry's collection at the University of Toronto. Um, but we were really privileged to have that come into our library around 2014. Um, it's used by my students. It's used by many scholars. And that's one of his many uh, legacies. Um, last year, Jim worked with us to bring Chuck Kwan, the director from Toronto, here to work with our students to coach them in media production. Um, and I, I always assumed there'd be many more years of these kinds of collaborations, but that's not the case. Um, so I want to pay tribute to Jim. Um, I'll make one more quick announcement before I go into our uh, writers today, which is that on October 10th, UBC will be hosting a day-long day of learning in commemoration of the Japanese-Canadian tournament 75th anniversary. Um, not only reflecting on that history, but thinking about what those legacies mean today in the context of Islamophobia, xenophobia, Phobia, attacks on civil rights across the world. So I would encourage all of you to please join us that day. We have a great lineup of workshops and other events, and please be part of this larger conversation that Jim was so important in starting. So now I get to do my official duty, which is to introduce our four wonderful writers. I will uh, introduce them uh, one by one, that they'll come and uh, read from their work, and then after that we will have a question and answer period. So uh, the first writer I get to introduce is Leslie Shima Takahara. Uh, whose memoir, The Reading List, won the Japan, uh, Canada Japan Literary Prize in 2012, and her fiction has been shortlisted for the K.M. Hunter Artist Award. Her debut novel, which she'll be discussing, I think, today, After the Bloom, um, it, uh, appeared this year from Dundurn Press. And in a Star Review and book list, the novel has been praised as personal and, trend, and entrancing, unflinchingly shining a light on this difficult part of history. Um, Leslie has a PhD in English from Brown University, which is actually where I met Leslie, like, 10, 15 years ago, because we were in the same department and the same program. Um, you should read her first memoir about what graduate school is like. <laughs> um, but it's also really, I remember uh, Leslie sent me her book, actually, when the, her memoir came out. I remember saying it to Alan Cho, saying, you got to watch out for this writer. So it's really wonderful to have you finally here in Vancouver. Um, and she lives, uh, she splits her time between Toronto and Hong Kong. So please welcome Leslie Shimo Takahara. Thank you all for coming this afternoon, and I'd like to thank Literate, Literation Festival organizers for inviting me to Vancouver and hosting this great event. Alan Cho, David Lee, and the late Jim Wong Chu in particular. Um, and I'd also like to thank Chris Lee, as he mentioned, my old friend from grad school days. Really delightful to see you and reconnect after all of these years. My novel, After the Bloom, is about the legacy of the Japanese internment, which my family experienced on both sides. My grandparents and relatives were interned during the Second World War in camps in the interior of British Columbia and at Minidoka, Idaho. It's a deeply personal novel, partly inspired by my late Japanese-American grandmother, who provided a kind of creative springboard for one of the main characters, Lily. Like Lily, my grandmother was a competitor in the Cherry Blossom pageant, a beauty pageant on the West Coast for Japanese immigrant young women. And like Lily, my grandmother suffered from the traumatizing effects of the internment, 
partly leading to the memory problems that she suffered from later in life. After the bloom is told from two narrative perspectives, the mother's and the daughter's, it opens in the daughter's Rita's voice. We're in 1980s Toronto, and Rita's mother, Lily, has gone missing. Lily has a history of dissociation and memory problems that have led her to wander off before, and Rita has always sensed that her mother's issues have something to do with how she suffered during the internment, but she's never known the full story. And never has Lily stayed away for so long. Although the police have become involved, Rita is unconvinced that they're taking the case seriously, and so she begins her own investigation. Now I'm going to begin by doing a brief reading from these opening pages. Their house had always been a wreck. The difference was that back then, Rita assumed all houses were like that. Paint on the porch peeling, like old nail polish, full of boarders, or guests, as Lily liked to call them. Everyone lined up in the cramped hall to use the bathroom at night. The floors of some rooms were so uneven that if Rita closed her eyes, everything seemed to spin gently, the feeling of drunkenness she'd realize years later. Cracks in the bricks up one side had gotten worse. Now the whole house looked tilted, about to sink. It was a bright, hot morning in July. Under normal circumstances, she'd be out for a jog. Instead, she was here, squinting up at her childhood home and lingering on the pavement as if someone had stood her up. Through the yellowed curtains of the house across the street, an old lady peeked out, probably wondering what on earth Rita was doing here for the second morning in a row, no less. Maybe Rita looked as though she were on a mission to scope the neighborhood, one of those rich Asians in the slum landlord business. A little girl ran by, her bright green t-shirt appearing to pulsate with the most amazing greenness, and it seemed impossible that normal life was continuing on. Kids were out enjoying the nice weather. For a blissful moment, Rita feel, felt like she could press the rewind button and slip back so easily into thinking that everything was going to be just fine. Of course it was. Lily had antsy feet and a whimsical heart. She'd wandered off before and had always come back. It was the trademark of women of her generation. Despite their veneer of stoicism, deep down, anger simmered. They were tired of doing everything for everyone, sick of life as doormats. So from time to time, they blew off steam, hit the road. All mothers did this, or felt like doing this, didn't they? Rita was a mum, and she'd felt that way before, as though she were destined to live like the little red hen. It was normal to go on strike, wasn't it? She closed her eyes and let the darkness take over. Not the comforting darkness of sleep, but a deeper, more frightening blackness. The pep talk she'd just been giving herself lost all conviction, sounded as hollow as it was. While it was true that Lily had traipsed off before, she'd always been found within a few hours. Someone had left a pile of old clothes on the curb, a faded mauve shirt with a crushed in collar, baby doll pumps in dark cherry leather, the round toes scuffed and flattened like they'd been stepped on. Lily had once worn shoes like that and carried a matching handbag. A wheezing sound gathered force from somewhere, and it took Rita a moment to realize that it was her own breath, the air shortening, dying in hot bursts in her throat, and all she could think was that maybe it was already too late. A vision swept over her, a small pallid face touched by a bluish tint, generic and expressionless, the way dead people appeared on TV. She squeezed her eyes tighter and refused to believe that face could be her mother's. Three days ago, Lily had gone missing. Missing people with a history of memory problems often go back to the places they used to live, the police officer had said, handing over a fact sheet for family members. It seemed this sort of thing happened more often than you'd guess. The cop, a woman wearing just a trace of nude lipstick, tried to be encouraging, but not overly so. She'd been through the drill before. Bloor Lansdowne, not the poshest part of Toronto, that was for sure. The houses were crammed so close together that they appeared to be falling into each other at uneven heights. Translucent shower curtains turned front porches into makeshift sunrooms, every second house festooned with Christmas lights that never came down. Very little about the neighborhood had changed since Rita's childhood beyond the opening of a new strip club. Even the humid air mixed with the humidity of her own palpitating body seemed too familiar, oppressive. 
What was she supposed to be doing? It didn't seem likely that her mother would miraculously stroll by. Yesterday, Rita had knocked on the door of the old house. An old, tawny-skinned guy had answered. No, he'd said flatly when she showed him Lily's photo. He kept saying no in response to all her questions. Perhaps he didn't understand English. Over his shoulder, she could see someone shuffling in the shadows. Peering in, she half expected Grandpa or Aunt Haruko to come into focus, as though for all these years, their ghosts had remained right here, keeping the home fires burning. But Aunt Haruko would have never let that grime build up on the windows. Now the place was inhabited by a hodgepodge of sad souls from far-flung, war-torn countries, the mysterious odors of all their foods clashing, blending together in an oily fog. Unclean. Yet that was what people had once said about her own family. Rita had never managed to forget the peculiar withering sensation of being looked at that way. And now, a couple decades later, here she was on the other side of that pitying, judgmental gaze. Up and down the block, and for four blocks in all directions, she'd plastered her bright yellow sheets on foam poles, telephone booths, mailboxes, missing person across the top. The photo had been taken on Lily's honeymoon last year. Although only the head portion had been cropped, Rita couldn't help but see the larger image. Smiling vivaciously, her mother was perched on the edge of a chaise long, white foam waves crashing down behind her, pina colada in hand, the tiny pink umbrella as bright as her lipstick. 60, she could easily pass for 10 years younger. Her dyed black hair fell in loose permed curls, remarkably similar to the way Rita remembered it as a child. Um, the second half of the novel um, jumps to Lily's perspective, part two of the novel. It's in 1942, and Lily is in an internment camp in the California desert. Um, I'm not sure if I still have a minute or two, or am I out of, have I taken up my eight minutes? Oh. <laughs> Who's keeping track? <laughs> No one's keeping track. So. All right, I'll just, I'm just going to read, uh, I'm just going to read the first page of part two. <laughs> At first he faded into the mountain shadow. Lily's eyes played tricks on her. That dark presence at the edge of her vision, could it be nothing more than sand and wind and her lonely imagination? The ground was a mess of chalk dust, flying up and mixing with the powder on her cheeks, sticky as cake batter. Should she turn around, cast a flirtatious glance over her shoulder? But that would seem immodest, and she had to leave those days behind. The further she walked, the more certain she became that someone was following her. An admirer in the middle of the desert? That meant she still looked pretty, at least somewhat. The rush of adrenaline jarred her mood from the falling gray skies. All the barracks looked the same, the same sagging makeshift steps and filthy mop perched outside, dried laundry, stiff and gray, dismal as skinned rabbits. Despite everything, an air of refinement still surrounded Lily, or at least she liked to think so, as she bent down to adjust the tiny buckle on her high-heeled shoe. Really, she just wanted an excuse to look back at her admirer, without making it too obvious, of course. Oh God, him again. She'd seen him gazing at her across the mess hall the other day, a dreamy smile melting across his lips. Before the war, she'd never had to associate with guys of this sort, their hats tied on with scarves, dirt-smeared shirts. They had a different way of standing boys of that sort, bending their knees as though their toes had sunk into the earth. Her father would have slapped her silly if he'd ever caught her mixing with them. Although in truth, he was once no different than these peasant boys, these kitchen boys, fresh from Japan. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So our next reader is Terry Watata, and according to your bio, the first sentence is, Terry Watata is a much published writer, which strikes me as the understatement of the year, because he has at least four poetry collections. He's a novelist. This is his second novel. Uh, the first is Kushio, I think, Kunshio? 
Kuroshio. Kuroshio. Okay. And then also other publications include two histories, uh, two manga collections, children's biography, and a collection of short stories, Dharma Days. And I'll just mention the first event that Jim invited me to go to was your Dharma Days launch. Ooh. So this better be as good as what I, at that time. Please welcome Terry Watata. No pressure. <laughs> thank you. Is this on? All right. Well, thank you, Chris. As you were introducing that, introducing me in that wonderful way, I had a memory of Jim several years ago when he uh, looked at me suddenly and said, why aren't you famous? <laughs> and he said it with frustration and anger, and I thought, whoa, you know, I felt guilty. I disappointed this guy. <laughs> and I think that that, in essence, is why he supported me all these years in every writing project that I came up with. He was always in my corner, always on my... I mean, he would, he would go to the publishers themselves and say, listen, you've got to publish this guy. And I said, whoa, okay. <laughs> and um, in particular, uh, he just... I showed him the synopsis of the latest novel. And after he read it, he said, we got to get this published. And I said, wait, Jim, i got to write the thing. <laughs> but he was there for me. He shepherded me through to, uh, well, today. And I'm very sad that he's not here to see it, to hold it. There's a nice uh, blurb on the back by him. Anyway, uh, the novel itself is based on uh, three characters, all with the first name Etsu, which means pleasure. And these men were in charge of three different kinds of pleasure. Etsu Jimori was a, uh, well, he was a gangster. And of course, he took care of the liquor, prostitution, God knows what else in the um, Japantown area of Vancouver. And it stretched out all across BC. And then there's uh, Etsuo Watanabe, who is uh, secretary of the Steveston Fishermen's Association. And, uh, well, he was notable in that he betrayed his community to save his family. And the third is Etsu Kaga, who was a patriot of Japan. He was born in BC, but uh, he uh, wanted to join the Japanese army. But the, uh, I think it was the Consul General said, you should stay here and work for Japan. Do everything you can against the Canadian government. Now, he's a fictional character, but I had talked to several Nisei, and it's amazing how many of them said, oh yeah, we thought Japan would win the war in a month. Six weeks at tops. But, Really? Oh yeah, Japan was so invincible then. Uh, we were, we were, well, we were confident that they would. Okay, so this part that I'm going to read is from um, Kaga's uh, story, and uh, late in the book, he is put into a POW camp in Ontario with uh, three layers of barbed wire, machine gun towers in every corner, sweeping, you know, searchlights, guards 24 hours a day, and, uh, and it held such incor incorrigible Japanese Canadians as uh, teachers, community presidents, you know, of various organizations. I think the president of the Buddhist church, Vancouver Buddhist church, was there, plus several others. And uh, one man in particular whom I found intriguing, his name was Tokikazu Tanaka. And for those in the know, he's actually the Chiba sister's grandfather. <laughs> yeah, see what I mean? <laughs> but... Uh, this is uh, a true incident that happened on July 1st. In those days, July 1st was Dominion Day. Today, of course, is Canada Day, which I think is ironic uh, for this incident. Now, t for, in terms of research, I interviewed a couple of survivors of this incident. So uh, the details, the overall details are true, I believe. At about 1.30 a.m. on the morning of July 1st, 
1942, the searchlights made their usual sweep of the grounds. It was a moonless night, and all was quiet in the huts except for the deep snoring. I slipped fitfully as a result, waking up every so often. Unexpectedly, loud shouting, wood splintering, and a peppering of popping sounds broke the silence. More panic cries, indistinct orders, and warning shouts followed. Then firecracker explosions in the air were heard. There were sharp pings off hard surfaces and the sound of kicked up dirt as everyone woke up. I came to a seated position. Hey, you hear that, I asked. Angry voices in the room coughed. Who the hell is making all that noise? It's too goddamn early for Dominion Day, someone swore groggily. Another volley of explosions went off, but this time someone cried near the window. Holy shit, those are fireworks from the towers. Hit the deck. I rolled and dove to the floor just as bullets splintered the walls and strafed my bunk while other bullets ricocheted off refugee pots, pans, and skillets. Reverend Mitsubayashi covered his head with his arms as he huddled in a corner. The door to Hut 9 burst open and tossed Umeda dove flat to the floor. They're trying to kill us, he screamed as he wriggled to safety. Who's shooting, Reverend? shouted. The guards, the guards, Tosh spat out, gasping for air. Why? Where's Kagasan, our leader? Where is he? The questions remained unanswered as the noise and confusion grew and grew until at last everything stopped a few minutes later. Discontent spread like wildfire through the four Japanese huts. In Hut 9, everyone grumbled about the gunplay. We're rats in a cage. What have they done to Kakasan? Tosh, what happened to him? I don't know. I don't know. I'll leave the kid alone. Can't you see he's all shook up? No one slept. At sunrise, three guards and their lieutenants stood as usual in front of the huts, waiting for the prisoners to assemble for roll call. They acted as if nothing had happened. Like everyone else, I remained very quiet. I didn't even dare move. Tosh crouched by a window and said in a low voice, they're waiting for us. Word by an anonymous brave messenger had come from Hut 8 a few hours before dawn. Tanaka-san orders everyone not to line up for morning roll call, he whispered at an open window. Reverend had wondered if that was such a good idea, though he was just as angry and perplexed. When no one came out of the huts, one by one the guards broke rank and turned to one another as if asking what to do. The lieutenant ran to the administration office outside the perimeter. As prisoner representative Tanaka demanded later that morning, that morning to see the camp commandant with five other representatives for an explanation of the army's actions. When Sheffield responded, saying he would talk to Tanaka in the interest of clearing the air, but only to him. The inmates, including the Yamato boys, began a hunger strike. I slid between my bed and the wall, going over in my head what had happened just a few hours before. I felt myself tearing up, my hands shaking. I placed my palms over my eyes, but I still heard the gunshots. The war surrounded me, con consumed me. The war then defined me. My editor was right. I wasn't cut out for this. Who was I kidding? Would I be killed like Hammerhead? I can't go with no food, Bullet complained. Ah, Reverend laughed. Despite being deeply worried about the situation, he tried to lighten the mood. Do you good. Get rid of that belly. Come on, fellas, Toss encouraged. Let's get serious. The anniversary of our emperor's victories in the South Pacific is approaching. Take strength from that. How do you know that, Bullet said with a sneer. I read. The barracks were filled with make busy activity. Some of the men settled into their bunks, others resumed an old card game. Tosh paced back, paced the floor. I thought for sure he would have broken down. He was a better man than I. Other read, others read books, all in an effort to take their minds off the smell of bacon and baked beans wafting in from the mess hall, an unusual meal specially prepared to torment us pr protesters, no doubt. Where'd them bastards get bacon, Bullet came to his feet. You guys don't understand, I gotta eat. We all do, not like me, the oaf said with a pout. I think I'm addicted. Baka, you're addicted to salt, Peter? I told you that stuff don't work on me. Will you stop talking, someone demanded. The gut and the groin, that's all you ever think about. Bullet sheepishly lowered his head and fell silent under a barrage of laughter. They're playing with their heads. Don't you see that? Advised the good reverend. 
Sometime during the third day of the protest, an anonymous military vehicle arrived at POW Camp 33, Petawawa. Out stepped an impressive looking officer of high rank. Lieutenant Colonel Sheffield saluted him sharply and the two marched out into the administration building, leaving everyone to guess who he was and what would happen next. Major General Harrison McPartland was altogether a different officer, more no-nonsense than the Lieutenant Colonel, if that were possible. He had no fear of open confrontation. In fact, he thrived on it. Shortly after his arrival, the Major General appeared in the open and by himself headed straight for Tanaka Tokikazu's hut. What a sight he was in his sharply cut hat, tailored uniform, and riding crop. The men took an instant dislike to the man. All right, you layabouts, what's all this about? He barked from the doorway of the hut. He spoke loudly enough for everyone to hear. Tanaka-san, perhaps a bit intimidated, shuffled forward, smoothing his hair with his hands. And whom might you be? Whom? Whom? McPartland mockingly laughed. Who the hell do you think you are? Roy Nishijima cursed. Yeah, I added, as soon as the strike was called, Tanaka-san has asked that I be there in his hut as a reporter, anticipating a confrontation with the military brass. Tanaka-san pulled him back. Take it easy, Roy-san, let the man speak. The tin soldier dismissed the irritating fly. I'm Ma Major General Harrison McPartland of Petawawa Military Headquarters, and who the devil are you? Tanaka Tokikazu, camp leader, he said as he bowed deeply. Right, I'm here to, today to clear up this mess. I've been thoroughly briefed and I understand why you're not obeying orders. I assure you the shooting incident will be investigated and will be treated as a separate issue. POWs must obey wartime rules and regulations as must be the military respect your rights. But know this, anyone who contravenes these regulations faces lifetime imprisonment or death by fire squad. The words weighed heavily. I could see that Roy couldn't believe what the Major General was saying. But we're not POWs. Your colonel said so himself. McPartland ignored him, not allowing the facts to get in the way. He continued. Now, I don't want to make this, take these things too far. But if you don't answer call, roll call, I'll be forced to take action. It's now 8.45, he said, tipping his eyes to his wristwatch. You have five minutes to get out there and form for roll call. If you do not comply, I'll be forced to take action, and you, Mr. Tanaka, will bear the consequences. The Major General then snapped his heels, turned away, and headed across the compound. As Tanaka mulled over the Major General's ominous words, a few inmates stared from the open doorway in dis disbelief. What action was this Bokanasu about to take? I and several officers could see, oh sorry, several others could see the tin soldier marking stiffly to the front gate. On the other side of the fence, a dozen fully armed soldiers stood aiming their rifles straight at our huts. The Major General stood erect at the gate, his arm crooked to count the seconds away. Four minutes! He shouted, his voice ringing in every corner of the compound. They were ready to shout, uh, shoot on command. Prisoner panic erupted. Tosh swung around and shouted, Oh my God, they mean it! They can't, they can't do it! We're Canadians! Doesn't that mean anything? Some scrambled to find a convenient cooking pot or pan for protections. Others closed their eyes to recite the Nembutsu. One or two called to rush the guards. At three minutes, Tanaka-san rose to his feet, gathered himself together, and walked through the door. Enough is enough, he shouted outside. Tanaka Tokikazu, with head held high, walked straight across no man's land to the Major General. He was a beacon of reason in a world gone crazy. The sun, just beginning to get hot, caused a raw light on the drama. We held our collective breath from inside our hut as the Major General, ignoring Tanaka, called out, Two minutes. No one said a word, horrified at was what was taking place. Reverend murmured the Nembutsu to himself. One minute, 30 seconds. Want to know what happens? Read the book. <laughs> Our next reader, oh, I'm sorry. Our next reader is Leanne Dunick. 
um, who has published fiction, poetry, and nonfiction in various magazines and anthologies in Asia, North America, the UK, as well as chapbooks by Leaf Press and Onsiem. She, in 2015, she won the Alice Munro Short Story Contest, and being of mixed race, Leanne's work explores identity and culturally diverse narratives. So she is the author of a book of lyric prose entitled To Love the Coming End. Please welcome Leanne. Thank you, Chris. Terry, I just want to say that you're famous to me. <laughs> Not only are you a multidisciplined writer, I think you should have your own radio play show as well. <laughs> I'm Leanne. This is my book, To Love the Coming End. It just came out this year. And I had, I guess it wasn't a vision, but more of um. I don't know what it was, but I had this thought in the middle of the night that I should read you guys my book backwards, starting from the last page and reading backwards. So I haven't done that. It might totally flop, but I'm going to do it because that's what sleep told me to do. <laughs> well, I'm going to do it until it doesn't make sense anymore. Actually, I should say um, the book doesn't really make sense when I read it, read an excerpt from it. It has many narrative threads, and you kind of have to read the whole book for it to come together. So typically for a reading, I curate a section to make a narrative arc, but um, I'm not going to do that today. I'm going to read from the last page, and then I'm, I might read some things that pertain to some unfortunate current events. And I should also take one more thing. It takes place in British Columbia, Singapore, and Japan. Every 11th month. Sometimes thoughts of you lead me to vomit. Without you, the landscape has changed, but it is clear that you were, are a part of it. I tell myself that no love is wasted, that love I am unable to share directly finds a way to target. It spreads through terrains, typhoons. It's ingested and teared by another loved one, and you wipe that tear with your fingertip, and then my love has found a home. If not this, then there is nothing. I hold on. There's nothing else to do. To be in Japan after the quake, to witness the complex endurance of lives ripped by sharp seismic spasms and aqueous assault, to face those who remain for hope that somehow we will not only survive, but thrive. 311, a million tons of debris in transit to opposite shores. To Hoku residents waited quietly, single file, for water and rice. Mishima believed that Japan's brutality was the result of emotion, a sudden explosion to free the Japanese from constant consideration of manner and elegance, that it still existed, concealed, perhaps awaiting its next eruption. Listen. There are some that survived both Nagasaki and Hiroshima bombings, and another who survived nuclear bombing and 311. Niju Hibakusha, blessed or cursed? Energy is diffused through geographies. Underestimated our effect on the slow process of plate tectonics, oceans, atmosphere, Surely the vastness can handle the burying of what we cannot contain so that there will be no more bursts of cruelty. Okay, I think I'm going to stop reading backwards now. I'm going to read with, I mean, anyone looking at what's trending on whatever format. Um, we have all sorts of natural and unnatural threats. I'm going to read 
Maybe I'll read this backwards too. Um, sure. Actually, no. I'm going to read it forwards. Why not? I'm going to read about um, nuclear threat. Fukushima Daiichi. Steaming mountains, wounded and wounding. Radioactive mist, a nuclear exhalation. Masao Yoshida disobeys orders, cools reactors with seawater, prevents a greater disaster, saves lives. Later, given a verbal reprimand for ignoring headquarters directives. Waves, seismic, oceanic, sonic, nuclear, undulating, crippling. The Fukushima 50, mostly men in later in years, unlikely to bear children, stabilizers of nuclear reactors. Prepared, prepared for death, they spared younger men from the consequences of serious contamination. They embraced Bushido, sacrifice, loyalty, honor, the warrior's way. Mishima would have admired their determination. Public paralleled them to the wandering samurai, the 47 Ronin, Ronin wave man. Within me, a gaping crevice. The more I change my environment, the more I lose track of myself, yet I traverse. Maybe that's the point. Nothing is anchored. Today is unstable, easy for people and land to split. Minerals grind a geological dance. The balance of the Earth's axis shifts. Chile, Indonesia, New Zealand, Haiti, Japan, where next? The unsure crust hectares the Pacific Northwest, evidence of instability buried under substrate. A story mounds. Volcanoes circle the Pacific. Enamored with its terrestrial beauty and sea, British Columbia forgets it lies on a restless coast, scattered with summits of hardened lava, pumice, volcanic ash. Imagine a seismic rip. Plates warp, lock, pull, instant fractures. After shocks. In the horizon, a wave emerges. A white line becomes a mountain. Surge and retreat, thunder and silence, sirens. Rush of the waves return. Grab, toss, suck, sam, slam, sweep. Ghosts swarm a floating world. I'm realizing this kind of feels really down, so I'm going to just stop for a sec. Um, <laughs> I, I realize I also forgot to thank everyone um, who brought us all together here. It's so great to connect with these other writers and meet the famous Terry Watada. Um, <laughs> but really, I understand how much hard work this is. So thank you so much for bringing us here together. And um, yeah, I mean, with a book called To Love the Coming End, it's not, it's not going to be a happy book. Um, <laughs> I should mention that it also has a companion album to it, which is called To Love the Coming End of the World. And officially, it's not released until November, but there are preview copies for sale here now. But if you do buy this book, it also comes with three free downloads. And it, the music's not that depressing. Um, okay, let me see. Something, okay, it's pretty much all depressing, but I'll, I'll read um, one more page. Respiration is forgetful. Circulation refuses my hands. Pain in my skull is equatorial. Wake with vessels broken in my ear. No cocaine, but heart palpitations. Jaw is fixed. Walk, toes curled. Denude cells like a mountainside. Skin births freckles worth watching. Strands of bitter brown turn to bone filaments. 
The cinch of a muscle bends me in half. Shoulder is electric. Eardrums resound frequencies. Eyes closed, I see music in black and white when we all know there is no such thing. Ribs restrict the ability to sing. Memories become dreams, and dreams are where I peel dry sections of lip. Sleep leaves imprints of fingers round my neck. Looking behind is a physical impossibility. Why my tail still twitches in your hand. Thank you. Thank you, Leanne. So our fourth uh, speaker today will be um, Eleanor Guerrero Campbell, uh, who came to Canada uh, in 1977 with a degree in English and Comparative Literature, uh, as well as a Master's Degree in Urban Regional Planning. She is a regional planner, community champion, as well as writer. Uh, among her many uh, initiatives, including uh, co-founding the Multicultural Helping House Society, she directed the Looking Ahead Initiative, a roundtable of stakeholders involved in improving the labor market integration of immigrants. She was the co convener of the City of Vancouver's Immigrant Partnership Program Committee. She authored Hiring and Retaining Skilled Immigrants, a Cultural Competence Toolkit. She was CEO of the Minerva Foundation for BC Women. And because that's not enough, she, her first novel, Stumbling Through Paradise, A Feast for Mercy from Manuel Del Mundo appeared last year from Friesen Press. So please welcome Eleanor Guerrero Campbell. Thank you, Chris. Um, like the other authors here and um, other authors I have met during this wonderful festival, I have to thank Jim Wong Chu for the um, coming out of um, my my novel. Uh, when I was just um, in the process of writing it, he had heard about my novel, and so he said, Eleanor, why don't you um, submit uh, an excerpt to Rice Paper? So I said, well, all right, okay, great idea. So I did that, and Rice Paper published the excerpt. And then uh, it became my first published fiction work, really. And then... Um, when it got finished, when my novel was finished and it was uh, published by Friesen Press, again he spoke to me and he said, well, Literation just said that, okay, you're going to be one of our featured authors for Literation 2017. And I said, oh my gosh, you know, that's wonderful. And then a few days later, it seems, after I returned from holiday, I, I hear that Jim Wong Chu passed. And I thought, this is so unfair. I've not had a chance to thank him, you know, and uh, there's, he, he's too young. <laughs> there's many more, you know, first time Asian writers out there that are needing his support. But then I also know Alan Cho and all the other people in literation, and they are, I know, doing their best to continue that tradition and that legacy of support to Asian Canadian writers. So thank you very much to Literation, Jim Wong Chu, Alan Cho, and all the other volunteers who have been dedicating their time to this. Um, now about my book. Um, so I'll just read a little bit of the what it's about from the blurb of the book. Um, and then I'm going to read uh, excerpts from the three parts of the novel. Um, Stumbling Through Paradise, A Feast of Mercy for Manuel del Mundo, follows the journey of one Filipino family who leave everything behind in order to build a new life for themselves in Canada and their struggle to find their way. Blocked from finding work in their respective fields, despite their qualifications and skills, they must decide between pride and practicality, survival and surrender. The choices and concessions they make will impact their lives and the lives of their children in countless ways. 
and in the end, it will be up to the second and third generations to offer redemption and help create the paradise their parents had hoped to find. So the novel is structured in three parts. The first part is the first generation, the story of Manuel and Josie Del Mundo, the um, emigres from the Philippines to Vancouver. Um, the second part is the story of Sonia, their second child, who was 13 years old when she came here. And the third part is the story of Manolita, who is the youngest child in the family, who was five when she came here. And another person, a mysterious person, which I shall not reveal and not read because you got to read that part. So um, I'm going to... Um, read now from part one, okay. And here, um, Manuel Del Mundo, who is uh, an engineer in the Philippines, uh, is having trouble finding work in his field, just like a lot of immigrants, if you don't know. And I see some newcomers here, or maybe not, or those who have experience uh, with newcomers, you understand. I hope, what we're going to be talking about here. So, um, this is a scene where Manuel Del Mundo is talking with his buddy, Paquito, and another buddy later on, Gary, who are also in the same boat. And it's just to give you a flavor for what newcomers uh, go through, skilled immigrants, okay? What's the matter with Canadians? It's like they never even received my application. Are they too good for Filipinos? That's how they are. They don't recognize Philippine engineering degrees. I applied to so many companies and heard from no one until finally I asked a personnel officer why they did not call me for an interview. She said they do not recognize engineering degrees from the Philippines. Paquito was a friend of Mario's and an engineering graduate. He worked as a night cashier for a 7-Eleven store in Vancouver. So then what are we supposed to do, I said. Study all over again here in Canada. You must be joking. A building in the Philippines is the same as a building in Vancouver last time I looked. Or have they never been in the Philippines? They think we still live in three, in three houses, said Paquito. The story was the same everywhere I applied. I heard about a security job. I applied, had a short interview, and was offered the job. I accepted readily, and on the way out, the man said, it's graveyard, okay with you? I wasn't sure about working in a graveyard, but uh, thinking of my family, I nodded just the same. At least no one would see me there. On the bus, the ridiculousness of the idea dawned on me. Did I come to Canada to do this? I resolved not to come back to work there. Paquito slapped me on the back later, laughing. Gago, you fool. That means working 11 p.m. to 7 a.m., not in a graveyard. So that was the last time I tried to apply for security jobs. Through Paquito, I met a few Filipino engineering graduates from the same school in the Philippines, one of whom worked on a construction site as a day laborer. Gary was 10 years younger than me. Hey, the place is called Labor Inc. I come early in the morning, and if I'm lucky, I get called for a job that day. One day, I might construct kitchen cabinets. Another day, I might do drywall or clean up construction debris, just whatever. It pays better than 7-Eleven. Why not give it a try, said Gary. So, I gave it a try. But I couldn't qualify for anything. Have you laid tile before? No. Put up drywall? No. Paint? No. Sorry, that's all we have today. So I came home empty-handed. And that night, Gary asked me where I went, as he did not see me on site. No, no, he said. Just say yes when they ask you for experience. And then you stick with me. I can show you what to do. And never, never say you're an engineer. They won't get you because you would be overqualified, said Gary. 
And so that was the last time I tried to do construction labor work. Well, someone said, well, why not McDonald's? I went to McDonald's in the local town center. There was a job opening for a bus boy and for a janitor. I did not want the bus boy job because people would see me. The janitorial job was better because it was hidden from view. I accepted the job. The manager must not have been older than Bobby, my son. The boy manager showed me a cart full of cleaning tools and pointed me to the toilet. I took one look at the mess in the first cubicle, thought of how I came to Canada to do this, and retched on the floor. After cleaning myself up, I walked out of the restaurant. That was the last time I applied for a janitorial job. So that's the end of excerpt one. Fast forward. Sonia is the daughter of Manuel, and she was 13 when she came. It's now 10 years later. And she is very, she's been haunted by the failure of her father, who is now dead, uh, to succeed in his profession. And she vowed that she's going to try to do something about it. And so here is some of her effort. This is Sonia, who is being interviewed by a CBC host. So why Bamboo Network? Asked the CBC interviewer. Well, bamboo is a plant that survives the strongest storms because it bends with the wind. It grows profusely in Asia, where many immigrants to Canada come from. Immigrants succeed when they are like the bamboo, resilient, flexible, and connected to each other and Canadians in a helping network. So how is it a helping network, said the interviewer. We have so many skilled immigrants arriving in Canada, yet very few of them are able to practice their professions. The engineer from India ends up driving taxis. The nurse from the Philippines works as a cleaner in hospitals or caregiver. Why? Many reasons, but one of them is the lack of understanding of how professions are regulated in Canada and not knowing how to look for jobs here. Newcomers apply for jobs in their field, but no one responds to their applications. For many of them, it's a mystery how to get jobs in their field. So, running out of savings, they take the first job that is offered, usually an unskilled labor job. Nothing wrong with these jobs, except newcomers are not utilizing their full potential. And Canada is not utilizing the full potential of skilled immigrants. So, enter the Bamboo Network. We provide newcomers with mentors, people in various professions, many of them immigrants themselves, who are now practicing their professions. Or they may be professionals who have lived in Canada all their lives and wish to help immigrants practice their professions. Mentors, what do they do? Says the interviewer. Well, mentors work with newly arrived immigrants. They explain the types of jobs available in the newcomer's profession, where you can apply for them, who regulates the profession, and how. Mentors refer jobs to their mentees, coach them on their resumes, interviews with them, and sometimes provides them a per personal reference. Often mentors and mentees become friends for life. And what are your results so far? Well, we now have engineer newcomers getting entry-level jobs, entry-level engineering jobs at companies where the mentor works for. The mentor's introduction, referral, and coaching help the newcomers get the job. The job may not be at the newcomer's level, but it's at least in his field where he can have the chance to show his full abilities and work his way up. Bamboo Network sounds like a great idea. What inspired you to create this program? Well, my father was a successful engineer in Manila, but could not practice engineering here. It broke his confidence, and it tore our family apart, and in the end, he died broken because of it. 
I was only 13 when we arrived in Vancouver and saw my father change from a successful and confident man to a failed, angry, and bitter man. And I promised myself that I would do something about this. I'm sure your father would be very proud of you now. Is there anything else you want to say to our audience before we say goodbye? Well, to skilled immigrants, don't give up hope. There is a way to realize your dreams in Canada. Learn it and implement it. We can help. And for everyone else, we invite you to be mentors in the Bamboo Network. Call us or drop by. It's easy to be a mentor and satisfying. You can help make a difference in someone's life, build friendships, and contribute to a strong Canada. So that's the end of the second excerpt. Are we okay to do a third one? About a minute and a half. Is that okay? All right. So the third one is from part three, which is the story of Manolita, who Manolita decides she wants to be a really big leader, like a prime minister, like a, something that inspired her. She saw the story of Cory Aquino, Cory Aquino's People Power Revolution, and so if she wanted to be a big leader. Along the way, she learns how really it should be, and uh, she met a lot of, uh, uh, underwent a lot of experiences in the community that showed her some of the problems of multiculturalism, some of the racism, uh, the monster house issues, uh, skilled immigrants not being able to practice gang violence and things like that. So she decides she's going to run for public office and federal public office and this is part of her campaign, okay? The symbol just came to me. Maybe it was all food, all the food in my family. All the food I rebelled against. Soup as a symbol for a truly blended Canadian society. The Canadian mosaic symbol didn't seem to work anymore. The whole was falling apart. So her, constitu or her constituents asked her, why soup? I explained in words that would be quoted often in the campaign. Canada is a land of immigrants. Most of us came from somewhere else and have now made our home in Canada. It's easy to say that we should just balance these two homes, our dual identities, but there is no such thing. We have one identity or we will be forever torn, schizophrenic citizens. We need to see ourselves as one whole delicious soup blended together where the onion is not crying for attention or the carrot or the chicken, but all of the ingredients harmonize to make a delicious rich soup where the combination of ingredients together is what makes the flavor of the soup distinct. Well, what's wrong with a salad though? In a salad, you have greens and fruits and nuts blended by a dressing, tasting as good as a whole, yet each ingredient is distinct in your mouth, they challenged. Well, the ingredients of salad are blended only loosely by a dressing, the way folk dances hold multiculturalism together, superficially. But the ingredients in soup are blended with the heat and time of ingredients, simmered together over hours. And that's the time spent by different cultures working, creating, and living together. That's why soup ingredients are fused into a deep unity, different from the unity of salad ingredients. But isn't that the same as the American melting pot? Far from it. In the melting pot, everything melts together so that the ingredients become unrecognizable. In a soup, everything is blended together, yet the ingredients are still distinct, and the whole soup is also distinct in its blend of flavors. That's the end of the excerpt, and I won't tell you whether she won or not. You'll have to read the book. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you to all four of our readers. We have a good 20 minutes for conversation uh, questions to our readers and our writers today. Um, so I'll just open up the floor and I'll sort of put up your hand and I'll acknowledge you. <laughs> Come on, we can break through that stereotype today, right? Okay. Yes, please. Okay, hey, Mr. Berry. Um, <laughs> do you have the most experience in publishing of all of these authors? How have you seen the Asian Canadian writing change over the years? Well, there was nothing in the beginning. <laughs> I don't want to be biblical here, but. Uh, <laughs> uh, my first awareness of uh, any kind of Asian Canadian writing was uh, Joy Kogawa, and then there was uh, Ken Adachi, and uh, what's her name? Shi Chang. She. Uh, Takashima, yes. And uh, that was it. That was from the Nisei. And it was, I, didn't, I don't remember any Chinese Canadians or Filipino Canadians mm -hmm. or Korean or whatever. Mm -hmm. Nothing. And. Uh, there was a man named Garrick Chu back in the 1970s. He was an activist and uh, pusher of Asian Canadian culture. And he was instrumental in bringing together communities, Asian Canadian community, to start this awareness. And out of that came Jim Wong Chu, you know, and Sean Gunn, and, well, dare I say it, me. <laughs> And uh, it built from there. And I think what it was was Jim had the right idea, become an advocate for it. And uh, you need that. And there, 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 there was a sense of togetherness, everybody coming together for a common cause, to the point where people could just write. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. David Wong, the... Uh, Tony Award-winning playwright said he didn't want to be a Chinese-Canadian playwright. He wanted to be a playwright. And uh, I think that's true today, that we are just writers. Mm -hmm. And if you choose to be an Asian-Canadian writer, or in my case, Japanese-Canadian writer, so be it. That's fine. And so I think that's part of the evolution of the Asian-Canadian culture and certainly the literature. Can I take a question and throw it to the other panelists as well? I mean, yeah. um, sure. since you are uh, more recent writers than Terry, um, did you have a sense of other Asian Canadian writers, or did you feel yourself writing away from Asian Canadian writing? And did you, was that in, on your mind when you were writing your works? Yeah. I'll speak to my first introduction yeah. of Asian Canadian writing. Again, it was Joy Kagawa for me, mm -hmm. as well as Wayson Choi. I remember when I read um, Jade Peony, um, I guess I was just a fresh adult, and um, reading that was the first time I had seen like my life on pages. Like I under I, I, my mom's Chinese, but sometimes I'm like, did she make up those words or are they actually Chinese? Because I, <laughs> I I just didn't know. But reading the Jade Peony. I was like, I know what those words are. So there was that, and there was a lot of just like, you know, the family dramas that I had experienced, and I saw other people experience it too, and that was the first time that I thought it was um, okay for the Chinese Canadian experience to be on paper, and that maybe it could be successful, and maybe people would be interested in reading it. Mm -hmm. um, for myself, I would say when I was growing up, um, in addition to Joy Kogawa, also Kerry Sakamoto's The Electrical Field. I remember reading that when um, I was a young teenager and being very moved by that. And um, but I don't think I don't think that when I was writing this novel, I was writing it distinctly with the Asian Canadian um, you know body of literature in mind. That was probably one element. Um, but many other writers, Canadian, American, of various backgrounds and ethnicities, sexualities, genders, um, equally influenced my work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have to I agree with uh, Leslie in that regard. Is uh, I didn't have a sense of uh, 
conscious self, a consciousness that I'm going to write Philippine Canadian literature or Asian Canadian literature or whatever. I felt so strongly that I wanted to write about the problems of skilled immigrants that I had seen working with them. And it's something that was I felt passionate about. They mostly happened to be Filipinos, because I was working with mostly them, but not only them. And uh, in my work, you will see all the other strands of my life showing up here. Um, I'm a city planner, so you'll see a lot of information there, reportage on community consultations in racism, about racism in neighborhoods, for example, or monster houses. You will see, because I'm also very much involved in advocacy for women, you will see a lot of um, material there about uh, leadership uh, of women, leadership of men, and how that happens. So uh, we are all, um, we are who we are, and um, it gets all reflected in our writing. Thank you. Other questions for our panelists? Yeah, Connie, please. Um, I was Terry's generation, and, and there was a real... Um, lack of our stories out there. So I'm really grateful that, that it's developed and, and there are more writers out there. I'm just wondering in terms of getting published, whether your publishers are always small press that understand your, um, your message, or whether there's the, the um, expectation that you write specifically about the And do they try to affect your writing? Anybody, Anybody want to take a stab at this? Leslie, <laughs> go ahead. Um, in my discussions with um, my editor at Denver, um, which is sort of a medium-sized Canadian independent press, um, there hasn't been, you know, like the editor said that she loved my novel, um, but she, you know, we talked about what I'm working on next. Um, it isn't a story about the Japanese Canadian or Japanese American experience. It's it's actually a literary suspense novel set in Hong Kong that, you know, draws more on um, actually my partner's family background. He's a Chinese Canadian guy who's got family in Hong Kong. So it's a much more sort of diasporic Asian identity um, that I'm exploring there. Um, and so, um, no, I, I, my experience hasn't been um, that I feel like I'm sort of being, you know, pigeonholed. And um, likewise, in conversations with my agent, um, he he has, you know, encouraged me to write broadly. Really, you know, he knows that um, I've got very diverse um, writing interests, and I I think my natural inclination is to sort of veer towards hybrid genres and. Um, and um, he's, he's encouraged me to experiment in that way. I think at uh, one time, and this again is a product of Joy Kogawa's success, <laughs> so there are positives and negatives here. You had to write about, if you're gonna write about Japanese Canadians, you better damn well write about the internment. <laughs> and the effects of the internment. That's why Carrie Sakamoto, I mean, she was very successful. Uh, I mean, big time writer, right? I mean, a three book deal, $100,000 advance, et cetera, et cetera, with a major public publisher. And she was writing about the, the effects of the internment. Um, but others, such as me, <laughs> uh, go to the small press because they're much freer with what you could. I mean, before Joy and Carrie and others, you had to write about uh, geisha, you know, in Japan, uh, mm -hmm. in the in the mm -hmm. cherry blossoms and whatever else, until the 1970s when you get the Kearney Street Workshop, who uh, down in San Francisco, and they wanted to get Asian American writers out there published with their own true stories, and 
there was negative to that too because if you didn't write about specific topics or toe the line, then you wouldn't get published. It's a double-edged sword, but I think as Leslie says, today it's quite free. It's, it's, it's open now. It's, you can write, you, you are a writer, not an Asian Canadian writer. And I, I think uh, the time is, well, we're blessed at, at this point. And uh, I think mainly because uh, we've come of age and we, mm. we're here. <laughs> Any panelists want to? Anybody else? Um, uh, it's nice hearing um, from, from Terry with all his experience in publication. And um, as you know, this is my first novel. Um, and I just learned the ropes about how to, you know, get pub, how to get edited, how to get published, you know, and everything. And um, you do your first efforts. You send your, you know, manuscripts and your pitches, you know, to the uh, various uh, publication um, presses, and then you get no replies or. Um, rejections, right? Um, I did that for about a year, uh, waiting around, and I said, I don't want to wait around anymore. And my friends, who had already started a, lit a literary reading of this book, said, why don't you go ahead and publish it anyway? So even the whole world of self-publishing actually was very complicated. So I had to find out you know, different kinds of indie presses or self-published or a combination of hybrid presses and so on. So I, I learned all about that and um, and in the end I selected one which was sort of a hybrid. They selected me partly, I selected them partly and then we we went ahead uh, with, uh, with a little bit of investment and it was reasonable so I said okay it's part of my learning process. So I did that and um, a lot of writer friends you know helped as well, and um, it's all out there. So um, thank you very much for the t tradition of the Asian Canadian uh, writers that has really earned a very good reputation with, um, with the presses, and I think that will help uh, us first time and um, uh, beginning uh, fiction writers. Really, Anne, because your book is not uh prose narrative in the more conventional sense. I think it seems, from what I can tell, it's a more experimental genre. Mm -hmm. Does that change the way you think about your work as an Asian Canadian writer, if you in fact think of yourself as an Asian Canadian writer? I do. It's, um, and I think that's because of the Asian Canadian Writers Workshop. One day I just saw my name on there and I was like, oh, it's official. <laughs> um, I was just gonna say, speaking to a little bit more about the publishing thing, um, not so much about content, but um, I have two publishers. I have an American publisher and a Canadian publisher, and it's been really interesting to see how the different publishers navigate cultural sensitivity. And so I think, um, like content-wise, we're allowed to write whatever we want, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the people putting out your work understands what you're talking about. I think they. Um, I think they want to be like good people and support writers of color, but there's still a disconnect because I think most of the publishers are predominantly Caucasian and don't actually have experience of what we're writing about. So that's, I think, a bit of a problem. Um, but that's going to change, and I wanted to mention that there are you know, a lot of presses, and obviously there's small presses at this point, but that specialize in publishing writers of color in particular, there's one from California called Kaya Press, and they've been they've been publishing um, Asian diasporic writing for a long time. And then locally we have Arsenal, which is um, pretty open um, with who they're supporting. And so yeah, I wanted to talk about that. Um, but as far as being experimental, it's just constantly a problem. That's all I have to say. <laughs> Uh, this book is called Poetry in Canada. In the States, they're marketing it as fiction. It's really hard to do readings. Mm. Um, it's, it's hard. <laughs> That's all I have to say about that. Next one's going to be normal. <laughs> uh, 
Are there other questions on the floor? Are there? Please. I'm just kind of wondering, um, since you started engaging with the writing community, if, you know, if it's just me and because of through the social media group that I get to see, do you feel as though so, um, writers of color have to be more activists, get more involved in the community and do more? I don't even want to start talking about that. <laughs> yeah, I still am. And, you know, I decided to start authors for indies. Mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, it's true. I mean, we got to fight a little harder. I, we don't have time to talk about this. <laughs> you can do the one minute to bridge, one minute to bridge version. Um, do any of you guys want to say anything? Gathering thoughts. <laughs> yeah, gathering thoughts. Um, I think it's awesome that you started author for Indies, Janie Chang, everyone. Um, I think just as as people, we need to fight for what's important to us. And I mean, I'm really inspired by hearing Eleanor talk about her motivations as a writer. Um, so wonderful. And I mean, we all have very interesting motivations for what we're writing about, um, but also how we exist in the world and how we interact in the world. And so now there are lots of platforms for us, for better or for worse, like social media, where we can pursue a lot of our engagement with others. And hopefully our writing itself can, can start dialogues and conversations. <laughs> OK. I find that uh, community engagement and activity and whatever else takes away from writing. <laughs> and uh, well, I mean, you know, you need time to write. And so recently I've started stepping down from various community uh, groups and uh, committees and whatever else, and I found it liberating. Of course, I, I'm also retired, so that helps too. But to get off those committees <laughs> opens up time, and so I can write. Now, the other part, though, is that uh, you feel alienated, you don't know anybody, or you don't see the other writers who can sympathize and empathize and all that. But, uh, and it's a balancing act, you know? That's what I find, anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would agree with you, Terry. Um, I mean, I think it's I think it's so wonderful that there are you know writers like Jim Wong Chu who who were out there organizing these um, literary festivals and being um, activists. Um, but at the same time, I think that every writer um, has their own sort of different creative process. And for some writers, like myself, I'm naturally much more introverted, and having that kind of um, seclusion to sort of go into that um, imaginary space. For me, that process is very antithetical to the social media scene of constant sharing and constant updates and constant, you know, support of others and also constant self-promotion. And so I think it's, it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a, um, it's a balancing act, as Terry said. Um, and I think every writer has to sort of um, negotiate that balancing act for herself. Mm -hmm. It's a great question, community versus solitude in the life of a writer. Um, I really think that we need, I need community. I need community in order to, uh, well, to, to live. Um, and in writing, it sure helps me that I'm in part of a, com a community, you know, uh, the Thursday Writing Collective in downtown Eastside, or, you know, other writers in uh, Listening Post, or, you know, other writers in Canadian Filipino Net, you know, that I'm involved with now. And it's a, it's certain um, male Tobias, and uh, anyone can act theater, you know, people in the arts who sort of help sustain your interest and the, the fact that this is important too. You know, so um, I find I need community. But you're you're right about how you need to carve up time to now write that thing, right? So I find that um, I say yes to certain you know requests or help in this community, and I love to do it. But then you know sometimes you know it occupies your time and your energy. You know the 
the mindset for finding grants for an organization and cohering a whole new organization is different from the mindset of uh, creating a piece of fiction from beginning to end, you know, and, and all of that. And I remember the delicious time that I had um, writing um, um, uh, Stumbling Through Paradise when I had just retired and I had also been diagnosed with breast cancer. I had to stay home, actually. And and I couldn't do anything, I must not do anything but get better. And that's where I began my novel, and it just kind of completed from there. So I, I'm not saying I'm on breast cancer again, I'm all okay, by the way. But, you know, that kind of sense of, you know, carving up something and really saying, this is my time for the fiction. So I'm always trying to find a little bit of that for my next project. I'd also like to clarify, I, I don't want to alienate. <laughs> it's too late, it's too My, late. Yeah. <laughs> I, I love the Japanese Canadian community. I love the Asian Canadian community and all the interaction that's going on. But just don't invite me to do something unless you got money. <laughs> uh, are you quitting our artist directory committee now? Is that what I'm hearing? Uh, yeah, I think my uh, duties with the artists uh, committee is over. Why? Okay. No, no, just are they complaining? <laughs> that bastard Watada. <laughs> I also stepped down from the landscapes of injustice uh, and others. <laughs> uh -huh. Do you have time for me one or two more questions? Uh, yeah, Elisa, good. Um, similar to the activism question, um, I think in an interview somewhere, Jim Walsh said something about, well, we were just a bunch of activists coming together and we just kind of decided to write. So I guess Jim was saying, I was an activist first and a poet second. So kind of a chicken and egg question related to activism. Um, do you see yourself as, as an activist first and a writer second, or is it more complex than that? Is it more like soup? <laughs> I think everything's soup. <laughs> just what kind of soup is the question. <laughs> I think it depends on uh, the time of life. Uh, <laughs> when I started, I started writing, uh, well, actually, I went, going way back, I used to play in rock and roll bands. That, that's why I can't hear very well, but uh, pop songs, you know, top 40, top 100, and, and I, we did it just for the fun of it, and we're playing all over the place and whatever else. But then, um, caught the bug of the Asian Canadian movement back in the 70s and so I started writing my own songs about Japanese Canadians and I found a great deal of uh, connection there and uh, it became like uh, my life's blood and I guess that at that point I purposely wrote about the Asian Canadian experience so that is activism mm -hmm. and then from there I moved into writing and uh, it's evolving from there and so I'm always mindful of the activist in what I do. I, can't, I could never do what Jim did. I mean, that guy was like <laughs> a generator. He just wouldn't stop, right? And, uh, and I think that's true activism. Hmm. And uh, I'd like to move toward the artist side of things rather than the activist side. Unless there's a true cause that uh, I need to raise my voice for. Um, I would say that I see myself as um, a writer primarily and um, you know when I mean it delights me of course though when um, people who have read my novel um, you know say oh I had no idea of this terrible period in Canadian history and you know I learned so much about the internment and um, I mean that you know that delights me that my work does have that political dimension um, and that was I suppose one of the reasons why I was attracted to this topic and um, also you know the fact that it, it draws on a body of family memories um, that have always been very um, inescapable for me. 
Um, so the political aspect of my work, I think it's, it's woven into my reasons for writing. The things that inspire me are tied to my personal history, collective memory. Um, but um, I wouldn't say that I approach the project by, you know, sort of saying first and foremost, what, what um, political cause am I trying to um, promote? What are the goals I'm trying to achieve? You know, or what sort of community building project um, do I have in mind in the way that, you know, someone like Jim Wong Chu very much sort of, seemed, he seemed to have a very, a very clear and coherent plan and strategy and um, I think that's why he was so effective at, um, at his tremendous community building work. Well, you know, I, thank you for that question. It makes me think, what drives us to write or what drives us to choose what topics to write on? And uh, I, I, think it, I think in general uh, we do that. Um, that which drives us passionately, that which we feel strongly about. And I suppose political causes are one of the major things that drives us, but certainly not the only thing. I mean, people like Alice Munro who, who, who look for the revelation of human nature, the small revelations like that, and that drives her to write the story uh, and another story of another kind of frailty and all that. So that too, you know, um, is a is a is a passion, right? It's not activism. So, I I don't think it's necessarily political activism uh, that sort of uh, that goes hand in hand with the writing, but but a, an underlying passion that uh, you need to unearth and to enlighten, and that's what makes us write. So one last question. Can I just oh, say one thing? Okay. And, um, just in response to you saying that some activists kind of came together and formed ACWW, um, I work for the Powell Street Festival Society, which is another organization that came out of a similar feeling and is now in its 40 something year. So um, I think I just wanted to comment on the fact that art can be so instrumental in change. And personally, I didn't sit down and think I'm going to write a political, whatever this is. Um, but um, I really care about the environment, and it's quite clear in this book. But I, I, didn't, I didn't sit down and think I'm going to start beating people over the head about environmental causes. But maybe I did. But it wasn't intentional. <laughs> <laughs> one more. One. One more question? Yes, go ahead. This is for Leanna. I noticed that Terry mentioned he had a band. You have a band that's performing in the Writers Festival. That's right. October the 19th. Is there any relationship to the music? Did you write and book the book? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the book is called To Love the Coming End and the album's called To Love the Coming End of the World. So they, they're both, um, some songs are more directly related to the actual text of this book, but some of them are not. Um, but they do have, I have this, I guess my mandate in life is to embrace the good and bad and, you know, we're all, the end is coming. Like, whatever end means to you, um, it's coming. And so I just want to <laughs> embrace that and celebrate it and celebrate the now. And so I think both, both works speak to that. And my thesis at UBC is also an album and it has similar motivations. But yeah, music, I actually feel like I identify with writing music more than I do writing um, this. Um, or anything else that I work on, but I can't, I can't just work in one discipline. I have to work in many other disciplines. I don't just write weird stuff. I write short stories and, <laughs> and nonfiction <laughs> and stuff. So, um, yeah, I just need to express myself in many, many ways. Thank you. So I think I need to start uh, drawing this session to a close. Um, but uh, before we have a chance to thank our panelists, um, I've been reminded to, rem uh, to let everyone know again that there are books available for sale over the table there. 